Welcome to the Jay Martin Show, where we dissect the greatest minds in geopolitics and finance so that we can better understand the world. Now, my guest today is one of the best educators in macro finance, but most importantly, he puts his money where his mouth is. He's an investor first, educator second. And today, we're going to talk about what he's seeing in the treasury and currency markets and why this matters. And most importantly, where he is putting his cash as a result. This is The Jay Martin Show, and here is my guest, George Gammon, the rebel capitalist. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with George Gammon. George, it's great to have you back on the show, man. Good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Always fun to chat. So look, here's where I want to start. You've always got an interesting take on things and your content is one of my first stops whenever something big in macro happens <laughs> because, well, you, you dig deeper, like you go a few layers deeper than most and try to get to the root cause of things I find, which is very helpful. So stepping back on this week, today's Friday, August 9th, we're going to turn this around and publish it, you know, within 24 hours so we can talk about timely events. What's your take on uh, the the major market correction on Monday, um, high perspective, George. And then more importantly, does that change your outlook on the medium term at all? And if so, how? Medium term, meaning like the next six months? Next next six months. That's perfect. Yeah. I don't think it changes much. It just pretty much confirms uh, what I've been looking at in the treasury curve. And for me, I always, I always start there just because I think it's the most powerful economic indicator we have. And uh, the curve uninverted, the twos and tens on Friday. And usually when you see an inversion or an uninversion, it doesn't just like happen right at once. I always use the example of like a kid sticking his toe in the, in the pool. And he knows the water's kind of cold, but he really wants to get in the pool. So the first thing he does is kind of dip his toe in there and, oh, oh, and he retracts. Oh, my gosh, that's cold. That's cold. But then... Uh, you know, he, his, his desire to get in that pool just increases <laughs> to the point where he's like, well, I'm going to go ahead and put my foot in there. And then he puts, you know, it goes up to his waist. And then finally he goes and, and dives in. That's usually how the curve inverts and uninverts. Mm-hmm. And the reason I pay so much attention to it is the, the hard landing or recession or whatever you want to call it. It typically happens after the curve is no longer inverted. So you have an inversion, and that pre, that has preceded every single recession we've had going back to the 1950s. Now, we have had an inversion where it didn't result in a recession, but it's extremely, extremely rare. And so what you have to do is you have to not only look at the curve, but you've got to look at all the other economic data that we, that we see. You have to look at the unemployment rate. You have to look at the SOM rule. You have to look at what corporate America is saying. You have to look at what's happening to the consumer. You have to look at what Disney is saying, what McDonald's is saying, what Airbnb. And then you have to put all these things together and try to come to a conclusion as to what the probabilities are that we will have a recession, uh, hard landing, soft landing, no landing. And uh, going back to the cyclicality of the curve, usually you see the curve uninvert then the stuff hit the fan. And usually it uninverts initially kind of on its own, but then you get a steep, uh, a real steep uninversion or a steepening of the curve due to a bull steepener uh, as a result of the Fed dropping rates. And yep. most people think that the Fed dropping rates is just going to bail everyone out, but they need to be very careful what they wish for because the Fed has never dropped rates and prevented a recession. They've only dropped rates in response to a recession. (laughs) And I just saw an article uh, for those people who are in the stock market. I just saw an article that was really good on uh, market watch. And it was a chart that showed it went back to, I believe 1984, maybe the mid 1970s. I just scanned it briefly before we went live. And it was talking about how the fed rate cuts only help the market. If we are not headed for a recession. And so I don't know why they didn't just look at the curve, but another way to say that, I just tweeted this out, is you could just say the only time Fed rate cuts result in stocks going up is when the curve isn't inverted. And when it is inverted, you get the opposite. 
uh, after the Fed cuts the first time, usually the stocks, uh, I think they were using the S&P 500 as a proxy. Okay. They usually go down by, call it 15, 20%. Usually see um, a close to, if not a bear market after the Fed drops for the very first time. And then you also usually see the uh, interest rates along into the curve go down further than they already have uh, in the process of inverting to begin with. So this is, I'm a real, I'm a big cycles guy. You know, if something has happened 90% of the time since 1950, I'm going to go ahead and put my money on, it's it's likely going to play out the exact same time. I think especially when you're looking at the, the treasury curve, to say this time it's different is even more dangerous than that saying typically is. So that's kind of what I'm focused on right now. And my, my point, I guess, to answer your question specifically, is what we saw happen in Japan or what we've seen with Norin Chukin Bank in Japan, you know, that was about a month ago, uh, what we're seeing with the unwind of the carry trade. I, I think the a lot of people in the mainstream media like to peg this downturn that we've seen in the market or the volatility increasing, specifically on the yen carry trade. But if you go back to the soft CPI report that we had about three weeks ago, I think that's really when it started. And when I mean it, I'm talking about the narrative change that you usually see in these type of cycles when bad news goes from being good news because, oh my gosh, the Fed's going to cut rates, so that's great, to, holy cow, bad news is actually bad news. And uh, going back to that uh, soft CPI, the NASDAQ tanked, and you would expect the NASDAQ to do the opposite. So that was where I first kind of got the spidey senses and said, mm -hmm. wait a minute, maybe this we're at that point in the cycle when you do see that narrative shift. And then Powell came out, um, I, think, I think it was last Wednesday, and he gave a very dovish uh, press conference. And again, you would expect the NASDAQ especially to rip higher on that. And once yeah. it started to digest the information, it goes straight down, goes down on Thursday, goes down on Friday, and then you get the big uh, brouhaha with the yen carry trade. So I, I think it was more about the market realizing that, okay, we've been too myopic here and focusing on rate cuts good. We need to zoom out. And when we do, we understand that all this soft economic data that we're receiving is uh, likely – uh, bringing us to the point where the Fed's going to drop, not because they want to, but because they actually have to. And if we look at history, that's usually negative for risk assets. Yeah. Okay. I want to back up for a minute and ask you to elaborate on the correlation between yield inversion and a recession. You said 90% of the time since the 50s, an inverted yield curve precedes a recession. We can look at that correlation, but I, I'd love you to, to explain the why, George. Sure. Why do those two things correlate so closely? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is what so many people miss. In fact, a lot of expert economists out there on Bloomberg or FinTwit, I, I see them making this mistake. And a lot of them even come to a crazy conclusion that the yield curve itself actually produces a recession. Like, hmm, okay. <laughs> I guess maybe they're thinking because of, uh, you know, the, the flat curve is really bad for banks or something like that. But anyway, getting back to your point, I think it's uh, the reason it's so powerful is because insiders have information that we just don't have. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it's it's not just uh, illegal insider information. It's just if you're Jamie Dimon or you're a big bank, all your customers are these huge corporations and multinational uh, corporations, and they know they have all this boots on the ground intel that you don't have, and uh, the, the CNBC doesn't have it, we don't have it, and they can see these things way in advance. So when they start to see all like the demand for loans going down, when they start to see their customers at uh, dinner with these multinational corporations, you know, the CEOs, when they're out to dinner with Jamie Dimon and they say, you know what, things aren't looking good. Uh, we are really gung ho. We thought the Fed was going to drop rates. We, were gonna, we thought we we're going to have this soft landing. But it turns out what we're seeing you know, is the consumers really pulling back and the consumers tapped out. And most of that, uh, you know, rebound, let's say, from 2020 to uh, 2024 was a result of artificial things uh, that 
the government did during the, the COVID period. And now we're having to pay the economic fiddler, if you will. You know, the rubber has to meet the road at some time. And so I think what happens is the Warren Buffett types, the Stan Druckenmillers, the, the, the Jamie Dimons, and uh, Paul Tudor Jones, you know, guys like that, that really have connections with not just uh, business leaders, but also banking CEOs and banking insiders and uh, domestically and internationally. They see that we're starting to trend toward risk. And therefore, once they see that risk increasing, they're going to go ahead and they're going to buy treasuries. They're going to buy the long end of the curve. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of these global banks will do with their balance sheet capacity. So it's the banks also in these financial institutions and the insiders looking at their balance sheet capacity and saying, okay, do we want to lend into the real economy or that's in the United States or the global economy, Japan, you know, pick your place. Do we want to lend and take that risk or do we want to just take that balance sheet capacity and buy the long end of the curve because we see storm clouds brewing and we want to be in the kind of quote unquote risk free, the most liquid, the safest type of asset we can be in, even if we're getting a slightly lower return. It's all about risk and reward, all about mm -hmm. risk and reward. So when you see uh, the curve invert, it's usually a result of two things. Number one, all of these financial institutions and insiders that have information we don't buying the long end of the curve because these they see the economic storm clouds brewing. And then while at the same time, the Fed is usually increasing interest rates at the front end of the curve, mm. which is why you get that uh, inversion you know, with, with short-term interest rates being higher than long-term interest rates. And then that adds insult to injury. That just pours gas on the fire. And then you usually get the Fed behind the curve once again. Uh, and then when they drop the rates, like I said earlier, it's in response to a recession. It's never to actually prevent a recession, and uh, especially when the curve is inverted to this degree. So that's why, you know, COVID is always an example I use because the curve inverted in August of 2019. So a lot of people think that was just a fluke, but I, I, I personally don't. Now I have no inf I have no uh, way to prove this. This is all just kind of me trying to connect the dots. But again, if you're Paul Tudor Jones and uh, you get a call from a banker in China that you know, and he says, "Hey, you really need to pay attention to this Wuhan thing," and this you know goes back to August, and you say, "George, why do you peg August?" Well, if you now read the reports, they say that if we did have this lab leak or whatever it was, they they take it back to the summer of 2019. And so what's going to happen? Well, that guy at the Wuhan lab is going to call his local politician. The local politician is going to call the local banker. The local banker is going to go up the food chain and call the politicians that call the, uh, the, the, the banks in the euro dollar system. And they're going to get on the phone with Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon is going to send a research assistant out to Wuhan to get the boots on the ground intel himself from the scientist who probably – you know, spilled the vial or whatever it was, right? And yeah, then yeah. That, that research analyst gets on the phone with uh, Paul Tudor Jones and says, dude, this is legit. Like, mm. like, this is legit. Like, this might not lead to a global pandemic, but we're at probably a 10% probability right now. Right. And so then Paul Tudor Jones thinks about that, and he's like, well, yeah. okay, even if this is a 10% probability, I need to hedge my bets, and I need to be in treasuries immediately, immediately. And that's why you could have seen uh, the curve invert along with uh, the other things that we talked about. But that's just an example of something that could have happened where it's not illegal, but these guys just flat out have information. And they're, they're running billions, collectively trillions of dollars. And, um, you know, if, if they see a problem like that, if they see big risk, they're going to go into the most liquid and the safest asset. And uh, whether we like it or not, that's treasuries. Right. OK. And so, yeah, in some sense, this is the whispers of the, you know, not the smart money, but the smartest money hedging their bets early because, you know, call it insider information or just call it, you know, the plethora of resources that they have access to that they will absolutely use to their disposal in order to get ahead of things. Um, you, you just follow in the hints. Yeah. And they get the real information, too, because these CEOs or banksters will come on CNBC and say one thing. Because yeah. they don't want to freak out their shareholders. But after a couple, you know, old fashions, 
at, at the steakhouse with, with Paul or with Soros or <laughs> Druckenmiller or whatever, you know, the truth comes out sure. and then these guys go ahead and trade accordingly. Yeah. Okay. So what do you make of uh, U.S. economic data today, George? Because there's, you know, there's two conversations happening. There's the perpetual hard landing still coming, recession coming, and there's various degrees of dramatics, you know, on that front. And then you have the opposite side. There's always a defense against this. Like, no, I don't know. Earnings aren't as bad as they look. Um, actually, earnings are stronger than we expected them to be. And therefore, trending back towards a soft landing. Um you know, uh, jobs market data is polluted by immigration. It's not as bad as it looks. There's always these like That's counterpoints, right? Okay. So what's your take? What's your take? Well, let's start with the uh, immigration causing high unemployment. I actually did some research there and I don't think many people have. So what's we, let's back up then. So what is, let's outline the situation that you're about to jump into here. Uh, immigration making employment look worse than it is. That's well, it's, 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 it's the, this time it's different argument. Okay. Which we see every single time in the cycle. But one thing that they really highlight or the rebuttal to what I've just said is, well, George, you can't look at unemployment because immigration is skewing the number. And if it wasn't for immigration, then unemployment wouldn't have spiked and we wouldn't have triggered the SOM rule. Uh, the other argument that you get the curve is, well, if the Treasury was issuing uh, you know, debt at the long end of the curve, then the curve would be nice and steep and we wouldn't have it we would not have had an inversion to begin with right those, right. Are, those are the two arguments that you always hear and therefore uh, you know we have to completely invalidate all of these metrics that have been so spot on in the past well we'll start with the uh, unemployment rate and this is just simply the household survey and they take the household survey and they compare that with labor force participation. And I, I don't know the exact formula they use, but that's how they get the headline U3 uh, unemployment data. And what's interesting is they, it, it's, a st it's a survey of 60,000 participants, right? And then what they have to do is they have to take whatever the responses are, and they have to plug that into an overall population number. But mm -hmm. the overall population number that they've been using or that they still use is census data from 2022. Okay. Prior to the uh, immigration explosion. Exactly. And yeah. they, and they're going to, and they're going to change that up, Jay, but they changed that up in January of 2025. And then they just moved to 2023 census data. Okay. So okay. if you want to argue it, it, it's actually the opposite argument. That if you did include immigration, uh, the, the immigration we've had since 2022, the unemployment rate would be much higher than it is because we're not including it. Yeah. So right. it, it's so to, to look at the SOM rule this time and look at it back in the you know, GFC or 90s or whenever, it is definitely an apples to apples comparison. That, that, that's just anyone who says that really hasn't done the homework. And then right. let's look at the, the, the yield curve. So what the claim there is that Janet Yellen isn't issuing anything at the long end, and therefore supply is so tight, uh, ironically with deficits exploding and the debt being at 35 trillion. <laughs> it's kind of a weird argument, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, that's what's bringing down those rates. But this to me is kind of a, a similar argument because if you look at the actual uh, amount of debt outstanding at each point in the curve, it's much higher today than it was in like 2019, uh, much higher. So uh, sure, the percentage might be slightly different uh, on the edges, but um, it's, it's really not impacting. If you think about why people buy the curve or why people buy treasuries or what the treasury market really tells you, what interest rates tell you there is really about future growth and inflation expectations. And there, it, it doesn't have much to do with supply. And although that's weird, I know it's counterintuitive to say that, but if you just look at history, that's kind of the way it plays out, that rates at the long end usually are, you know, there's thousands of variables, of course, but the, the main uh, contributing factor is just what future growth and inflation expectations are, because you're always going to get paid back your principal plus interest. So yeah. that, that's one reason. Uh, so, um, but going back to this, also, I, I read a study the other day. Uh, from uh, a group of economists. I, I know Rabini was in there, Nuriel Rabini. 
And they're talking about this uh, exact same concept, but they're looking at it through the lens of there being stimulus for the economy that we otherwise wouldn't have. And that stimulus is being controlled by Janet Yellen because, you know, by not issuing at the long end of the curve or issuing a lot less then uh, she has brought down interest rates and therefore mortgage rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that just trickles through the whole economy. But even with their study, uh, Jay, it, obviously they, they took the math on what the percentages usually are. Yep. And then they calculated the actual deficit. So the new issuance and said, okay, well, if we had the normal percentages, this is how many 10 year treasury uh, bonds or notes or uh, whatever they're called. This is how many 10 years we would have. And uh, they came to the conclusion that if they normalized everything, the 10-year treasury yield would be a whopping 25 basis points higher than it is today. So okay. even if you want to use that argument, you're still at like, a, a, you know, we're, we're still 100 basis points inverted. <laughs> so th th those two don't hold up uh, much weight under scrutiny in my view. Okay. Okay. I, I knew you were focused on both of those points, so I wanted to bring them up. I want to pivot a bit, George, if we can. Uh, one of the biggest topics on my show is the trajectory of de-dollarization. And mm. you can get super hyper hyperbolic with those forecasts, or you can temper <laughs> your enthusiasm and say, these are transactions occurring on the margin and not really a big deal, depending on who you listen to. Um, maybe I'll start there. What's your yeah. take? on the de-dollarization conversation? Well, it's a fantastic uh, topic and it's, it's fascinating for sure. But what, where you have to start and where I think most people get confused is you have to start by understanding that the vast majority of dollars that exist were lent into existence. They weren't printed. And this makes all the difference in the world. So what happens when uh, currency is lent into existence is it actually creates demand for that currency in the future. And then what happens if demand goes down, then the debt that created those currency units to begin with is extinguished because you pay off your loan. And when the loan is paid off, the supply actually goes down. Whereas if you have printed dollars, let's say like printed green pieces of paper, and let's say that you lend me $100, Jay, and when you just lent me that $100 from that $100 bill that was in your back pocket, you did not increase the money supply. Therefore, when I pay you back next week, I didn't decrease the money supply. Mm -hmm. But if you're a bank, you would have lent me that money, not by pulling it out of your back pocket, but you would have created a loan and that process creates $100 that did not exist before. It did not exist. Mm -hmm. It's just money out of thin air. There's no Federal Reserve involved. There's no green pieces of paper. It's just simply they create a deposit. A, we call it a commercial bank deposit liability. And then the offsetting asset is just simply the loan that was just created. And so if I pay that loan back, then it decreases the money supply, all is being equal, by the amount of the principal I just paid. So if people kind of get their head around that, then you have to ask yourself, okay, if we have a pie chart of the total dollars that exist on earth, it, you know, cash dollars on balance sheets right now, we, we, there's no way of knowing this uh, definitively, not, not even close, but we can kind of assume that if we got $110 trillion global GDP, probably 70, 80 trillion of, of dollars on balance sheets. Now, uh, maybe you know, M2, I forgot what it was, maybe 20 trillion, something like that. So you got to figure there's at least 50 or 60 trillion of dollars outside of the United States on balance sheets. And almost 100% of those, Jay, were lent into existence. So let's just assume for a moment that the Saudis change the petrodollar or everyone starts using the BRICS currency or something like that. Okay, that's fine, but let's just think that one through. Uh, if that happens outside of the United States, then you've got all these Saudi Arabian folks that don't want these dollars. Mm -hmm. Fine, but you still have the dollar debt. 
So what do they do with those dollars? They pay off their debt. And what does that do to the supply of dollars? Drops it. That's right. So when you have a currency where the vast majority of currency units were lent into existence, you get into this kind of bizarre um, scenario where the demand for the currency actually controls supply. And especially if that debt is super short term. So if we had like, uh, it, let's say all the debt that created the 50 trillion outside the United States was 30 year mortgages. Well, then velocity would play a, a role there because you wouldn't need to pay off that debt right away. Uh, those currency units could circulate all around the economy and create inflation or create the dollar tanking or whatever it is, yeah. um, you know, because you've got 30 years before you have to pay that back. But what happens is the majority of debt that created those $50 trillion outside the United States is extremely short term, Jay. Uh, on, from experts I've talked to, on average, maybe two weeks a right. month maturity right. okay. yes so, very sure. yeah so it, it, then the other argument you know alongside this is well uh let, let's say they don't have debt then they're going to dump all these dollars and they're going to come flooding into the united states and that's going to create consumer price inflation here or hyperinflation and uh that maybe i mean that i would i would agree with that a little bit more than the other stuff or i could see the probability of that being higher uh than the dollar absolutely crashing which i think is almost zero relative to other currencies. But you could see that uh, create consumer price inflation or higher uh, consumer price inflation in the United States. But then what you're doing is you're taking all those currency units that are needed for that debt that's due in two weeks and you're bringing them into the United States. So how the hell do they get out? The answer is they don't. And what's gonna happen to the value of the dollar outside the United States it is going to skyrocket. I mean, if, if let's just assume that there's 50 trillion and you had 10 trillion come in because the Saudis no longer want those dollars. Let's just say they don't have any of that dollar denominated debt. Well, somebody outside the United States does, Jay. Yeah. Somebody does. And if those dollars are now trapped in the United States and they're not circulating, you 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 gotta you got you basically have a dollar short squeeze. How are the holders of the existing debt gonna service that debt when there you the go. The flow of U.S. dollars is going one dire- going one direction, right? That's right, and, and or the same thing can happen if velocity of the currency units outside the United States decreases as a result of let's just say a global recession, uh, right. because those banks are risk off, like we talked about earlier. You're seeing that uh, play out in the yield curve. That's what it's telling you, and then the financial institutions. So they're a lot less willing to lend, and if they're a lot less willing to lend then what you have is not only the amount of currency units on net balance going down because more loans are being paid off than are being created, but you also see the velocity of those dollars slow down, which means it's even harder for those entities that have that dollar debt to get the dollars they need to service it. And then you say, well, George, what happens if they just don't pay off the banks? That's another argument you get all the time. Well, if they just don't pay off the banks, or if they don't pay off the loans, then the dollars still exist. Okay, <laughs> well, let's think that one through, Jay, because what is what at the end of the day, what's a dollar? It's just simply a commercial bank deposit liability, especially mm-hmm. outside the United States, where there are very few uh, green pieces of paper uh, and very few bank reserves, right? The, that's really a domestic thing on the Fed's balance sheet. And it is true, they have access to those reserves through correspondent banking relationships. But most of what happens in the euro dollar system, it's really doesn't really settle, uh, let's say, on the Fed's balance sheet, right? So uh, you've got these people that are, or these entities really, that are trying to get those dollars that they need to pay off the debt. Uh, They can't, so they default. Then what happens to the bank? Well, the bank that lent them the money, it blows a hole in their balance sheet and they go bust. Okay. But all the dollars that were in existence were a liability Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of that bank. On that now default bank or that now. That that just went bust. So what happens to the dollars? They disappear. They're gone because Mm -hmm. all that dollar was, was just a a liability of that bank that's no longer here. Right. So So that would be even more deflationary. 
it, it would be. And so either way, whether the debts are money good or not, the dollars still disappear at the conclusion of the loan, either through yes. debt repayment or bank insolvency because of good Yes, loan because contract. all dollars are, with the exception of the green pieces of paper, yes. all dollars are, are just, uh, they're just a liability on a network of global bank balance sheets. That's it. Right. Do you, do you see anything right, right now, George, that may trigger that kind of activity that would reduce the velocity of dollars outside the United States to the extent that this could become pretty real for a handful of these countries that are holding U.S. dollar debt? Yeah, and I think that's why when you look at the Japanese banks, going back to what has happened more yeah. recently, Jay, yeah. you'll, in, and I haven't followed it the uh, last couple of days, but um, on Monday, of course, we had that huge, huge, huge drop in the Nikkei. I think it was down maybe 10 or 12%. And the next day, we had that just rebound right yeah. back to almost where it was uh, the day prior. But you'll notice that that was the Nikkei. If you look at the index that just represents the banks, I forgot exactly what they call it. The topics, I think. The topics, there you go, thank you. Yeah. You'll notice that that didn't go up as much. And a lot of these banks, uh, these big banks in Japan have lost like 25% of their value just in the last week or so. And 25% mm -hmm. of their market cap just completely wiped out. So they got hammered a lot more than the rest of the corporations in the index. And I think the reason why is because the market is waking up to the fact that a lot of them have the same issues that Norin Chukin Bank had uh, a month or two ago. And that's where they borrowed all of these dollars back in 2020 and 2021 to buy treasuries. So they're borrowing dollars at, let's say, 1%. And they're, they're buying assets that are yielding 3%. So they're pocketing the 2% spread. It's a you know good business. So they're, But the problem there, Jay, is all those dollars that they borrow in 2020 and 2021, it's not like they're 30-year fixed rate loans, mm -hmm. right? These are, these are just loans, again, that they have to roll over every two weeks or they have to right. roll over every month or so. Yeah. So they don't have to force sell those assets that they bought with the loans to begin with. So that makes them very sensitive to interest rates. So when the Federal Reserve is raising rates from zero up to five, five point two five percent, now all of a sudden we call them your dollar funding costs. These banks' dollar funding costs are at five percent instead of one percent, and they have a negative carry because they're having to borrow at five percent, but those assets that they bought are only degree. yielding three percent. Yeah, And okay. so that puts them in a very compromising position, obviously. They can't have that negative carry indefinitely into the future, so they have to liquidate those treasuries at a huge loss. And Norin Chukin took, a, I think it was a $10, $12 billion hit on that. But what's more important is what they have to do next. So what they have to do next is somehow replace those 3% yielding treasuries with an asset that's going to yield more. It's going to yield more than the 5% that they're having to pay for those dollars to begin with. And I'm just using round numbers here just for the sake of the example, guys. These aren't exact numbers. So what do they do? Well, what Norin Chukin did, and I imagine most of these other Japanese banks did the exact same thing, is they started buying CLOs, derivatives in the United States. Okay, well, what's the underlying asset there? Well, it's junk corporate debt, mm -hmm. and it's things like United States commercial real estate. So let's connect these dots. We see the commercial real estate market completely blowing up. We see credit spreads starting to blow out on junk debt, which means that these assets that in the form of a CLO that these Japanese banks were forced to buy are starting to decrease in value. And this puts them into a position where they really have no other choice but to hold on to them or just take a massive hit or just go completely bust. And when you think about the global monetary system, just being a network of these global bank balance sheets, if you have some big banks in Japan go bust, that's going to increase the amount of risk, which to your earlier point is going to decrease the velocity, which is going to decrease the dollar liquidity mm -hmm. because that dollar liquidity is not coming from the Fed. 
that that's the, the the banks create the majority of the dollar liquidity outside of the United States. So then that puts you into a position that we were just explaining before where there's not enough dollar cash flow, although there might be enough dollars to service the debt. And then you start seeing defaults. And then that makes the problem even worse because that blows a hole in the balance sheet of the banks that are there to provide the liquidity to begin with. And it kind of puts you in this doom loop. Yeah. Okay. And so does the, like, I, I don't know if there's any way to measure this properly, but uh, I've read that the Japanese carry trade may be approximately 50% unwound at this point. If you were to hear something like that, or maybe you've seen you know, a headline like that, would that lead you to believe that half the damage has been done and there's still more carnage to come from this direct example right here? Uh, well, maybe from the yen carry trade, but you have to ask yourself, you know, how much of what we have seen is a result of the carry trade? And okay. it, it's obviously not zero, but it's definitely not a hundred. Yeah, uh, right. So I, I would peg it at maybe you know fifteen percent. It definitely exacerbated the problem that was there. But the real underlying issue here, or one of the underlying issues, is the fact that these Japanese banks were forced to go out the risk curve, and they're holding a lot of these CLOs on their balance. These derivatives, these CLO derivatives on their balance sheet. Um, and these CLOs, the underlying asset, are assets that we're starting to see have big, big problems in the United States, such as commercial real estate. Yeah. So that is, we, we think that commercial real estate, as an example, is just isolated to the guy that owns that office building in downtown Phoenix. Right. But what we don't understand is that office building is connected to a regional bank and the regional bank is connected to risk, which which filters through the entire global monetary system, or or that office building in Phoenix could be part of a CLO tranche that was sold to a Japanese bank because they had to go out that risk curve and they had to find a 7% yield, just hypothetically here, because their dollar funding costs are 5%. So when we see these office buildings start to blow up or take a 50% haircut or whatever, we have to understand that it not only impacts that, it's going to also have a significant impact on the global monetary system. And then the question just becomes, where's that line in the sand where we go from, okay, everything's fine to, oh crap, we've got a big problem. You know, one of the visuals I like to use on my channel all the time is that whack-a-mole game. I know, you know the one I'm talking about, Jay, where oh, yeah. you're, I, yeah. I don't know, like Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. And it's got yeah, the yeah. little, and you start off the game at level one and the mole's heads are popping up pretty slow, like once every five seconds or something. So you, sure, whack, sure, right? sure. you can get them easy. You can get them easy. But what happens is as you progress, the mole's <laughs> heads start to pop up faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And even if you're at a point where you're bam, 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 bam hitting them down, if you don't realize you're playing a whack-a-mole game, you would stand back and say, oh, well, the economy is fine, Jay. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, don't, I don't see a problem. I don't see a recession. What are, you, what are you talking about? But what you don't realize is if you look beneath the hood, you see the, imp the probabilities of a hard landing increasing exponentially mm -hmm. because you're seeing all these problems pop up at a faster and faster and faster rate. And then it's just a, a, a question of how you know, at what point is it going to get so fast to where that guy is going to miss one of those moles and it leads to the type of systemic risk that uh, would create a downturn or potentially something worse? What is that something worse or what is that downturn from your perspective? You know, you can hear folks like Jim Rogers say he expects the next recession to be the worst of his lifetime, going back to a 1930s type scenario. Um, do you have any outlook or perspective on that, George? Um, how deep and, and what, what are your thoughts on, on the, uh, if we were to enter a recession in the next 18 months, 24 months, 12 months, I don't know if you have a, if you attach a timeline to it, but you know, what does that look like? No, I don't attach a timeline to it because it's, it's just, all I say is that this time it is not different from yeah. the standpoint of how the cycle usually plays out, meaning inversion first. Uninversion, Fed drops rates, stuff hits the fan. 
Now, how long that takes to play out, uh, I, I don't know. But that uh, my base case is that that's what we'll see play out again. So I'm going to have to answer your question two different ways. Number one, if we're going to use the thought experiment of the government not doing anything. Okay. If the government doesn't do anything, and I, I think even if the Fed wants to come out and buy – you know, do QE. I, I don't think that's really going to do anything either. And when they drop rates, again, they don't drop rates to fix something. They drop rates in response to something that's already happened. Um, now, maybe if they came out and started buying stocks like the BOJ, that that may change my mind. But let's just assume for a moment that the Fed just comes out with their standard, okay, we're going to start doing QE again. And the government doesn't do anything in the form of fiscal or bailouts. Then you, then I completely agree with Jim Rogers. Uh, my, my again, no certainties, no certainties here, only probabilities. And I, and by the way, I've heard. I just spoke with my good buddy Patrick Serezna from uh, Macro Voices in the Market Huddle, and uh, his base case is the dot com bust as far as that recession, and he made a very good argument as to why what we're seeing play out right now with all the markets is uh, maybe not exactly, but it definitely rhymes mm. with the dot-com bust where we just had kind of like a garden variety recession. So that's definitely mm. on the table, definitely on the table, but it probably wouldn't be my base case. My base case would be, we see like a, probably like a GFC type of thing. Um, and, uh, but maybe even more deflationary if the central planners step back and didn't do anything. But, if, if the, or maybe when is probably better said, when the central planners do respond to it, because I fully expect that they will, uh, you would probably see, I, I would honestly, I, I'd probably just assume it's more of the same. Meaning that when we get the dot com bust, okay, they respond to that with just interest rate drops. Okay, fine. Uh, then we get the GFC and they respond to that by dropping interest rates and doing QE and doing all these bailouts. So my point there is you'll notice they st the, each time we have a crisis, they do more and more and more. They take more and more of the medicine and they yeah. get diminishing returns. And then we fast forward to COVID and then it's like... It, it made the GFC or the response to the GFC look like child's play. <laughs> yeah. You know, we came out with trillions and trillions. I don't know what the CARES Act was, like four or five trillion, something like that. And so I would expect that they'd probably do the same, that instead of a CARES Act, we do like a CARES Act 2.0. And instead of four trillion, it's like eight trillion or something right. like that. And so assuming they do that, I would expect a... I don't want to call it a V-shaped recovery because that implies that growth goes back to trend, and I don't think it will. I think that growth will kind of notch down, and that will be a new trend line. And uh, But I do think we'll see a repeat of the wealth gap getting much bigger, Yep. where yep. it's going to benefit people with assets because the – Central planners realize that to keep this game of Jenga going, uh, they've got to, to prop up asset prices. Even if it creates all the homeless that we've seen, even if it creates the drug problem, even if it lowers the standard of living, even if it decreases the purchasing power for the average Joe and Jane, they, they realize that if the, the stock market goes down by 50% this time, it's going to be a much, much different story than uh, 2000, even 2008, 2009, because the U.S. economy is so much more dependent now on asset prices than it was even back then. And you mentioned earlier, Jay, how I'm, I live in Medellin, Colombia. That's true. And I always use this as a thought experiment to take it to an extreme. If the stock market went down here by 50%, no one would even know. And I, I, I literally don't even think it would make the, like the daily news. Because no one owns stocks. No one even cares about it. It's not even really a thing. So, uh, But the stock market goes down by 50% in one day in the United States, and you're going to have a, a, a not just a U.S. meltdown, but you'd probably have a global meltdown. And that just shows you the fragility, I think. And the central planners know that. So I think that'll be their, their focus. And unfortunately, you know, look at the difference that we have seen in society 
in the standard of living just since 2019. I mean, you guys might not see it a lot because you're in the, I don't know if you're in the U S but if you are, you know, it's kind of like looking at yourself in the mirror every day where you really don't notice these changes. But yeah. nowadays I only go back to the United States when I have to speak at a conference or something like that. So it might be, let's just say four times a year. Right. And even in those four times a year, Jay, I notice huge, huge changes every single time I go back. And when you compare it to 2019, I think it's night and day difference. I mean, yeah. just it's just people are walking around like zombies and you have the homeless problem and the uh, all these drugs. And, um, and it's obvious that especially for the average Joe and Jane, their purchasing power has gone down significantly, even though their nominal wages have gone up because they haven't kept up with the rate of consumer price inflation. And when they finally get a break on that inflation, well, what happens? The unemployment goes up, the unemployment rate, and yep. aggregate demand goes down because the only reason prices are going down is because the economy is in contraction. So you, you get this cycle where the price is always paid, unfortunately, by the poor and middle class. So I would expect that to continue. So assuming you're right, and absolutely, I noticed that too. And I, I think there is definitely some cities have been hit a lot harder. You know, yeah, as for sure. To the U.S. is like some cities you just... I used to host an annual conference every year in San Francisco. Oof. And so I, I watched that city really closely from like 2014 when I started working there until, you know, I haven't been there recently, but, uh, you know, I've seen what's happened there and it's been very dramatic. And that occurred like 2016, 17, 18. I was already seeing that city yeah. go to shit, to be honest with you. And then it really accelerated in the last few years. Um, Portland, Oregon, my wife's from Portland, Oregon, another city that we would just never go to anymore. It used to be lovely. I, lo I love Portland. Man. That's where I grew up, man. That's where I grew up. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really city. bad. But we have to realize that those, what you're seeing there is not just random. It, it's not just a result of, oh, people are idiots, so they're doing drugs now. It, right. it, this is a result of government creating economic distortions. That, 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 that's, that's, that's how this plays out. And so, you know, the response or the quote unquote solution to any problem we ever have is more government intervention, more government, bigger yeah. government. And yeah. what that does is that increases the amount of government spending as a percentage of GDP. And if government spending goes from 50 to 60 to 70, all the way up to, let's take it to an extreme, 100%, well, you would expect the economy to be far, far less efficient. Mm. If the economy is far less efficient, then we're producing fewer goods and, and services, and that is going to decrease the standard of living. It's just, there, there's no way to get around it, unfortunately, mm. other than to do the opposite, which is less government and, yeah. <laughs> and get the government out of the equation and bring back uh, free market capitalism. But in doing so, you also have to bring back bankruptcy. You have to let people yeah. fail. And that's just yeah. what we're, well, we as a society or the politicians and authoritarians refuse to do. With election cycles every two years, it's hard to imagine those hard decisions being made. It wouldn't be in any politician's best interest when you put yourself in their shoes and how they're thinking about, you know, their career trajectory, which is not aligned with the well-being of the, the public. Yeah. And then that goes back to the de-dollarization argument, because then the gold bugs and the Bitcoiners are going to come in and say, well, we just need sound money. And I, I think that is um, uh, it, it would definitely help. But I don't think that solves the problem, because at the end of the day, people are still going to vote for their free stuff. Yeah. And uh, if people are voting that way, then it's still, you know, the government spending is is still going to be there. And uh, because you know, whether we like it or not, the United States will even if let's say the U.S. was on a Bitcoin standard. OK, well, that would probably make more demand for their debt. So, you know, if they've got more demand for their debt than they already have, then, OK, well, that just allows them to spend much more and to produce more free stuff without having to tax it, you know? So um, unfortunately, you know, when, when going back to kind of the mechanics behind how the, the dollar system is created and why the probability of the, the, the dollar crashing is very low, and therefore it decreases also the probability of the dollar losing reserve currency status anytime soon. Right. Um, it also brings you to the sobering conclusion that there is no panacea, Jay. 
There's no panacea. Uh, the only way that we can improve things is if we get people, if we convince people that it is in their best interest to vote and to try to promote smaller government. And, and like we said earlier, that involves taking a little bit of pain. Yeah, it's man, I, I, I hope you're, I hope that's possible, George. <laughs> I don't know, so, man. It's, it's the only way other than just a complete and outright collapse. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that, that could be, you know, I hate to go there, but that if you look at the fourth turning as an example, uh, I remember I interviewed Neil Howe. This was maybe a couple of years ago, and I was really trying to press him on what the probability is, you know, how the four, how the fourth turnings usually play out. And, you know, as as you know, he's been saying that we're right at the tail end of this fourth turning. We likely see it conclude at the end of the 2020s going into the 2030s. Yeah. And I kept trying to to find like the glass half full or the light at the end of the tunnel. Sure. Yeah. And he kind of got snappy with me and he's like, George, look, you don't understand. Every single time in the past, this has ended in war. Right. 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 That's the bottom line. Yeah. So yeah. that's the best way that I can answer your question. I, I, I don't, you know, is that the glass half full? I, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's not inevitable, but we just have to look at probabilities. That, and that's, the way, maybe yeah. that's the only way out. Jay. I don't know. I hope not. Obviously. I hope not too. But I, what I appreciate about his take is that he's stepping back from his emotional response or what he wants the outcome to be. And just like you said at the front end, you're a cycles guy. Well, let's just look at, Maybe how this movie's played out the previous four or five times or six or seven yeah. times. And, you know, another uh, Dalio has written a bunch on the similar subject yep. of like True. cycles of empire, looking at the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the British, taking those blueprints, laying them over America today and saying, OK, guys, what inning based off of the movie we've just watched five times? What might be what inning might we be in today? And it doesn't give you an optimistic outlook, it, it, you know. So where I come to with this is like, all right, well, what I can do is control my own personal sovereignty and make right. sure that whatever occurs, myself and my family are set up, right, to be yep. durable and, and prosper and all this. So and a plan B and have a plan B because there are some bright spots in the world today. That's for, I mean, look at Argentina. Right? Yes. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, yeah. they're kind of been down in the dumps for quite a while. And obviously the standard of living in Argentina is not what the United States is, but they're on the right trajectory. They're going in the yeah. right direction. Who knows how long it'll last? I don't know. But uh, I was just there a couple months ago and it's, it's a fantastic country. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. People speak English. I think from a cultural standpoint and just the way it looks, uh, many Americans would not have an issue uh, being there for a long period of time because it just kind of fits right in with what they're used to mm. seeing, especially the middle of Argentina. It looks just like the Midwest in the United States, almost identical. And a lot of people speak English. But my point there is, yeah, see what you can do. Uh, don't bury your head in the sand like an ostrich. I always say that's a very poor investment strategy. Um, you know, this is nothing to lose sleep over, nothing to lose sleep over. It's just something to be aware of mm. and to prepare for so if in case things get a little worse, then you've got that plan and, um, and you might even be able to take advantage of opportunities that are created by a recession. And when we talk about things sliding down, with the, with the exception of war, of course, when we talk about things going into a recession, it doesn't mean that we're just like Rickard says, it doesn't mean that we're living in caves eating canned goods. It just means that we have a, a, a difficult period of time ahead, just like the GFC was very difficult. Yes. You know, although we had a rebound in the stock market, I remember the housing market didn't bottom out until 2012. I remember that vividly because that's when I retired and started buying uh, houses. And I remember back then, Jay, I would put up an ad in Craigslist for just basic workers, you know, tile guys, electricians, uh, plumbers and whatnot, handymen to help me remodel all of these houses that I was buying back then. Yeah. I remember the very first ad I placed, it was like for 12 bucks an hour, something like that. Okay. But this was 2012. And within an hour, Jay, I had probably 150 resumes, right. 150 resumes. Right yeah. now I went back cause I, I started selling my, I didn't start selling my rental properties until 2018. So I went back in 2016 
And uh, I had to, you know, do some touch up work on some of the properties. So I placed the exact same ad word for word. The only thing I did is I just ratcheted it up, you know, it was maybe 15 bucks an hour or something that was appropriate back in 2016. And I sat there, I ran the ad and I waited Hmm. and I waited Hmm. and I waited. (laughs) And after about three days, I might've had one or two resumes. Right. So that, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about living in caves, eating canned goods. I'm talking about 2012, 2012, which, which, which sucks, which sucks for a lot of people, but it's uh, not the end of the world. And just like real estate was an opportunity back then, we will see uh, probably just as good, if not better opportunities in moving into 2025 or 2026, assuming that yield curve is correct again. Yeah. Okay. Look, I I love that, man. Um, If you have time, George, one more question for you. Sure. Um, What's the portfolio look like? What's the life blueprint look like if we're moving into this uncertain territory? You know, how are you structuring yourself, your wealth to uh, weather the storm? Yeah. Well, I'm sure you say this all the time, but not investing in vice. This is just what I'm doing with my own personal portfolio. And uh, I've I've got a service with Lynn Alden and uh, Chris McIntosh called Rebel Capitals Pro. So I've got a couple of model portfolios in there. So the the main model portfolio, what I've done is uh, I set this up about, call it uh, six months ago, something like that. And I always start with gold, always. So regardless of what my strategy is for the specific portfolio, I start with gold. Just that's my insurance policy. And so I do 10% gold. And then my second priority is just make sure I don't lose money. And yeah. <laughs> that, should, that should be priority number one, two, and three. So uh, that, that's it. And for some people that might not work. They might want to take a little more risk. It's just my personal preference. So what I did is I went out and I bought uh, T-bills, one-year T-bills. And then what I did is I took the interest that I was going to be paid when these T-bills mature and I bought call options. And that's what gives the portfolio a bit of juice while I'm waiting for things to get cheap, such as commodity prices. I know we haven't talked about that, but I'm a firm believer that we are in the process or in the beginning innings of a long-term commodity super cycle. And these commodity super cycles, like everything else, the prices never go up in a straight line. It's yeah. always kind of a roller coaster ride, just like inflation is as well. Always a roller coaster ride. So we could be in a downturn here uh, for the next six months. It probably likely see lower prices if we have a recession. But I think that's really going to be your opportunity to hold on to maybe some of these producers that are paying a great dividend over the, the, the long term. So I want to have all this liquidity. That's going back to the, the T-bills there. But I want to have some upside uh, above and beyond just your 5% interest rate in the interim while you're waiting for this curve to play out. So what I did uh, back in April is I bought call options on the NASDAQ because I was under the belief that you know while the curve is still inverted and while bad news was still uh, good news at the time, that you would probably have a blow off top or you would have you know something hit the fan. It's kind of like a binary outcome. And I thought flat was kind of, uh, the probability wasn't too high. So I bought call options on the NASDAQ uh, back in April. And when that started working well, I doubled down. And then, but when we got that soft CPI report, that completely invalidated my thesis. Hmm. Because that's when Hmm. I think that that bad news became bad news. So I immediately sold, immediately sold. Yeah. And, uh, for, you know, fortunately we did quite well on that, but what I've done more recently is, uh, on Thursday of last week, I bought, uh, calls on the TLT Interesting. with that, with that money. And, but to, to be clear, uh, I sold half the position on Monday and I sold half the position because the liquidity, I'm still by no means an expert. Yeah, I want to make that clear. I'm just an amateur, uh, probably more of an amateur than, than a lot of your, your listeners and viewers. But um, I, I didn't realize that the call options I bought were very illiquid because I was going uh, about a year out and I was going way out of the money. 
to get I, as much pop as I could. And so I'm like, nah, I don't like the lack of liquidity here at all. Mm-hmm. So I went ahead and sold half the position on Monday. The other half, I'll, I'll keep it just to see how it plays out. But what I'm doing now is I'm waiting for the Fed to drop rates the first time. And when they do, I'll probably allocate that capital to more options uh, to try to take advantage of the, the way the cycle has played out in the past. And that's usually once the Fed drops, to state this again, uh, that's when we see the, the biggest decline in the stock market and the biggest decline in yields. Okay. I appreciate you going there. And so for anybody who wants to go deeper, Rebel Capitalist Pro is the, the tool yeah, to you do just, it. Yeah, you can just go to georgegamma.com forward slash pro georgegammon.com forward slash pro. You'll find George and two other familiar faces being Lynn Alden and Chris McIntosh, who have both been on this show a couple of times. Look, George. And they're a hell of a lot smarter than I am, as you know, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> they're both great, man. So are you, though. It's a, it's a power trio you guys got going on. You launched Rebel Capitalist Pro like three years ago, something like this? Yeah, it was in 2020. Okay, yeah, four years ago. Yeah, right. It was right after I interviewed Lynn for the very first time. I didn't. Back then, she only had about ten thousand followers on Twitter. You, you are I, how I found Lynn Alden back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was man. The first time I interviewed her, I was just completely blown away. Huh. Com- I'm like, this gal's a rock star. In fact, I think I texted her that uh, yeah, yeah. right after we got done. And uh, about two weeks after that, uh, I, I got her on Rebel Capitalist Pro, and kind of the rest of his is history. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Well, look, dude, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on, George. It's great chatting with you. Thanks for having me.